uh, this ministry from IHOP uh, in CRI, C-R-I is what it's called, went over there, and Daniel Lim's wife is actually from Myanmar. That's where she was born and raised. And she went over there and said, I've got food, I've got everything that will allow you to go and, and you know, we can build houses, we can build orphanages, everything that took place in Myanmar. And they said, you know, you, but she also preached the gospel, and they put her in jail. And I'm, I'm wrapping this up to say that um, the Lord opened doors, and when IHOP sent several hundred thousand dollars worth of food and, and again, money for orphanages, they said to her, whatever you need, you have it, and you have the blessing of the Myanmar government. So they are the only ministry that's allowed right now in Myanmar. They're preaching the gospel. People are getting saved over there mightily. So this is pretty exciting what's going on. And uh, the same type of, the same ministry that's out of Kansas City, um, I actually know the gentleman. His name is James Adams. And um, he's actually from Haiti. He was adopted by an American family when he was a young ch- uh, child. And he's part of the ministry there. And he's down in Haiti about every two to three months. And um, he went immediately. He has a lot of distant family that's, that's there. And so they have had feet on the street since day two, since everything hit. And they're providing a lot of medical supplies and everything. So this is a real blessing. I'll put this in James's hands and, and his wife, and they'll, they'll get this uh, to the necessary needs uh, in Haiti. So thank you, Pastor. You're welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. And thank all of you. That, that, we're not a real big congregation. That was a lot to raise. And we just thank all of you for being so faithful. What, uh, just one more thing. If you're hungry after church, you don't have to go to Burger King. We have hot dogs and chips and soda, and those proceeds are also going to the youth missions, and that'll be for sale out there in the foyer. Thank you all. Amen. (laughs) She's blocking me out. We want to um, welcome those of you who are visiting us this morning by webcast. Um, Last time that we had our webcast, which was two weeks ago, we had um, uh, people watching from Israel, people watching from Georgia, and Florida, and Tennessee, and New York, and we're thankful for that. We are <clears throat> this morning going to be speaking about the real Super Bowl. I'm going to show you the Super Bowl in the Bible this morning, which will kind of be interesting as we um, study the book of Revelation this morning, which is always a partially confusing um, undertaking, but I believe that uh, with the, uh, the help of the teacher, the Holy Spirit, uh, he will make clear some things that uh, we probably need to understand as we are entering into the, um, the last days. So we want to um, just welcome all of you who are watching via the internet this morning. I would like to at this time ask our ushers to come forward. Uh, gentlemen, if you will at this time. We are going to um, bless the Lord with this morning's tithes and offerings and almsgiving unto the Lord. Those of you who are at home can prepare in the same way. And I'm going to read out of Luke 16, uh, chapter 16, verse 10. The Lord speaking, saying, He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful in very much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous mammon, and unfortunately even the, the, the money that is in the world and the, the riches that are in the world according to the Lord is categorized as unrighteous mammon uh, because it comes from the earth. But the Lord says, If you therefore have not been faithful in the use of this unrighteous mammon, who will entrust the true riches of the kingdom of God to you? And if you have not been faithful in that which is the use of another's, who will give you that which is your own? Because no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Therefore, you cannot serve God and mammon, which is the riches of this world. And as you contemplate um, your priorities in life and 
how you prioritize either the things of the world versus the kingdom of God. Do a little reevaluation this morning because it's uh, obviously the beginning of a new year and a new decade, and we want to rearrange our priorities. Um, the Lord always says, seek first the kingdom of God and all the righteousness that is found therein, and all the other things, the things of the world, shall be added unto you. I think that's the most profound principle related to finances in the entire Bible. And many of us entering into this year are going to be entering into difficult times financially, but the promise of the Lord is that he will remain faithful to those who understand how to be faithful stewards to him as well. So let's pray in that light and bless the Lord this morning with the first fruits of our labor. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege of demonstrating faith in your principles and in your word and acknowledging the fact, Lord, that you know better about our finances than we do. Even those of us who have studied and, and been in financial institutions, Lord, you know so far more about what is going on on this earth than all of mankind. So we put our trust in you, Lord, and trust in your word, knowing that putting trust in the stock market and the economy and the government is probably not fruitful. Therefore, Lord, this morning, we sow into you first and into the world second. And we bring you the very best that we have to offer, the first fruits of all that you have given to us. And we pray, Lord, that you would be honored in this thing this morning and that your word would abound and be spread across this world, Father, and that the kingdom of God will be built in just the manner you have prescribed. We bless you and honor you with this offering, Lord, in Jesus' name. And the people of God say, amen. Gentlemen, you may go forward at this time. We just pass that through the aisles. And at this time, I'm going to go ahead and um, let's see if I missed anything here. Uh, dismiss the children to Children's Church. So young men and women, you can go to your place. As I said before, we, we are going to um, speak a little bit about um, the book of Revelation this morning as a foundation and uh, some fundamentals um, um, for what is coming up in the very near future. I entitled uh, this particular uh, message, A Personal Harp and Bowl Season. I know that sounds strange, but um, in the book of Revelation, you're going to find this terminology, which we will get to in a few moments about the harp and the bowl. And the harp specifically uh, is symbolic of all worship. Um, it's musical in, in its nature, the harp as an instrument, and it is utilized uh, by the creatures in heaven to worship the Lord. And then secondarily, you have the bowl. And we're going to just uh, have a revelation of what the, um, the real Super Bowl is. It is not between the cults and the saints, although that's very prophetic too, uh, because the cults are, horse, are horses, a type of horse, and some trust in chariots, and some trust in horses, the Bible says. And then, of course, there's the saints on the other side. Now, who's going to win, the horses or the saints? Well, biblically, the saints are going to win. So I don't know if that's going to pan out in um, South Miami or South Florida this morning, this afternoon, but we'll see how that works out. Um, I don't know who I'm voting for on that, on that game this, this afternoon, but we'll see how that turns out. But anyway, uh, there's a scripture I put up here. It will also come to pass that uh, before they call, I will answer, and while they are still speaking, I will hear. It's a very profound scripture from the Lord speaking to Isaiah the prophet in a very uh, uh, 
kind of a terminal situation in Israel's history. They were, they were uh, really facing uh, lots of perils from every front, sort of similar to what we're facing in our um, world today with Iran uh, almost ready to produce their nuclear weapons and um, uh, the economy being faced down as, as uh, difficult as that is and, and other issues that are arising right now. We're kind of in the same situation. And when the prophet of the Lord cried out um, to the Lord, the Lord responded to him, and he said, if the people will pray, if the people will call on me, he says, I'm going to answer them even before they begin to speak. So what that shows you is that the intent of your heart to want to communicate with God, want to be intimate with God, want to pray to God, which is not really an option plan for Christians. It's not one of those things that you can check off as uh, in the column, of, well, I'll, I'll do this or I, I won't do this. It's an option to be a Christian. It's absolutely imperative that we understand that our role and responsibility is to communicate with God. He wants to communicate with us. And he says that before they call, I will answer them. So even before you sit down and you start to call out, what's in your heart, when you are in difficult times and when your attitude is right, which is key and critical, when, if your attitude is, I want to be close to God, I want the counsel of God, I need his direction in my life. And the reason I emphasize that is because many people don't. Many people, some in the church as well, stand on their own strength. They don't require the help of God. They don't ask. And the Bible says, you have not because you ask not. And we go into lack in areas because we have not communed with God. We have not asked him. We have not prayed, not interceded, not uh, been a supplicant in supplication in our prayers to the Lord. And therefore, if you do not ask, you do not have. He says, but if your attitude is that you want your desire, the desire of your heart, is to communicate with God and have God to be the major function in your life instead of an adjunct function in your life. He says, before you even call me, before you pick up the phone, before you go and kneel at the side of your bed, before you pray in your car, he says, I'm going to hear you and I'm going to answer you. Here's the idea. The Lord actually knows what you're going to pray before you pray it. So he will answer the prayer even before you call. And while you are still speaking, or in the speaking, or trying to communicate what's on your heart and the needs that you have, the Lord says, I already heard it. I already heard it. I know what it is. I know exactly what you need. But I want you to communicate with me. I want you to um, be intimate with me, and I want to speak to you in terms that will help you to navigate through a very difficult season that is ahead. Many people think things are going to get better. The jobless rate just went under double digits to single digit. It went from 10 to 9.7. What they don't tell you is that a majority of the people aren't even reporting anymore. They're so frustrated, and they're off the unemployment rolls. They can't even collect compensation. Those people aren't even counted anymore in those roles. And the fact of the matter is, is that because of what is being spent by this government, it is an absolute fact that inflation must come at a certain point in history. It may come at the tail end of this year or the beginning of next year in a, in a large wave, but you'll see the effects of that this summer even. So while the dark is getting darker, in the church end of the spectrum, the light should be getting brighter and stronger. And the only key to the light getting brighter in you and I is our capacity to understand who it is that we're serving and why it is that we have to communicate with him. God wants to speak uh, to his people. So I want to um, start off with this idea of getting a picture in, you, in our spirit of what happens when we pray. And this will come out of the book of Revelations. You could actually teach this lesson out of every single one of the 66 books in the Bible, including the book of Numbers. 
Um, but this particular book, uh, the book of Revelation, I felt like the Lord said to, to me personally, I want you to teach in this format because we are in the end of days. And some of these things I'm going to speak about are, have already begun to transpire, have already begun to unfold in the plan of God for the last days. But I wanted you to try to get a, a picture in your mind because many people pray, and when they pray, it's just like, well, you know, I think I'm just like talking in the air, and I don't really know if it's getting through. I, I don't know where my prayers are going. Uh, is Jesus picking them up and carrying them to the Father? Is the Lord hearing my prayers? What happens with my prayers? What do they sound like to the Lord? There's a lot of questions in people's minds about what it is that you're doing when you are moving your vocal cords and sounds are coming out, and we're calling them prayer. So I want to start with the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. And I'm going to read uh, verse 1 through 10, but I won't get to the, the last five verses until later on, because I want to lay this uh, groundwork and I also want to speak to you this morning about the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls, and how that is impacting uh, to us in the last days. Obviously it is, because they're very strong judgments of the Lord coming upon the earth. Those um, 21 little items that are stuck and tucked away into the book of Revelation have an absolutely profound impact. And if you'll notice that on, on TV and stuff, you're seeing all of these uh, things starting to come on the television about the last days. Uh, even that movie by Tom Hanks has just come back on uh, the, uh, that, that code movie. What was the name of that movie again? Da Vinci Code? Yeah, Da Vinci Code and, and certain like that. That's all back on the TV now, and they're doing things about Nostradamus and... Um, um, one I, I looked at the other night, uh, and there's a renewed interest and a spiritual stirring in the air about things in the last day. Um, Revelation chapter 5 begins a process, and we want to read this, uh, and I'm going to read it out loud because it's the Word of God. And I saw in the right hand of him, capital H, who sat on the throne, a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. That word book, by the way, is biblos. It can be used for the terminology for scroll as well as book. Uh, they are interchangeable. So this particular scroll or book was written on both sides, but as it was rolled up, as they would commonly do in ancient Israel, when there was an important document that was going to the king, or the king was sending an important document. He didn't want anybody to read what was in that document. Okay, So they would write whatever they were going to write. They would roll it up. And then they would put these wax seals on the envelope. Knowing that if anybody broke that seal, they would be getting that information that they should not be getting. And they would be violating the principle of communication for the king and the one he intended to get that information. So seals, these wax seals, were put on this papyrus or these scrolls, and it would be a known fact that if the seal was broken that somebody got in there and saw what was being written before it was supposed to be exposed. And, interestingly enough, only the person who was designated by the king on the other end, the receiving end of that scroll, would be allowed to be the person to open the scroll. The, the carriers couldn't open it. Only the person who was designated could actually break the seal, open the scroll, and then read the decree of the king. So if you can kind of image this in your mind, if you will. <clears throat> I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written or a scroll on the inside and the back, and it was sealed up with seven seals, which was very uncommon in those days. Usually it was one seal that was sealing a document. In this case, we find seven different seals. 
And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, as angels are wont to do in heaven. They are the announcers of events. Uh, they are, the word is agalos, which means, actually, it's the transliteration of the word angel, but it means messenger, or the one who proclaims, the clarion, the one who speaks forth. So he sees this strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? So one of the characteristics of a seal opener was that you had to be a man of incredible character because of the nature of the fact that you were opening up the king's documents. And you had to be actually a worthy individual to be able to do that. So these, these, um, this scroll shows up with these seven seals on this scroll. And the angel says, okay, who's worthy? Who in heaven is worthy? to open this up. Now, you remember, there are 24 elders. There are four creatures in heaven. There's all kinds of seraphim. There are all kinds of angelic majesties. This incredible uh, array of living beings in heaven. And you would think that every single one of them would be worthy of opening up a document, but not so. He says, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven, or even on the earth, or under the earth, was able to open the book or even to look into it. And then this is John now speaking, of course, because it's the revelation of Jesus to John. John was caught up into the heavens. So John says, and I began to weep greatly because no one was found Worthy to open the book or even to look into it. So these are massive decrees, special decrees by God, and nobody in the entire universe, not in heaven, not on earth, not under the earth, not living, not dead, was worthy to open it. And John was weeping, and he was weeping greatly. Verse 5, and then one of the elders, apparently he was standing next to one of the elders, one of the 24 elders, said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. So it was found out, now this lion, this lion of Judah, we know him to be Jesus of Nazareth. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the stump of Jesse. He was the only one that was worthy, that could be found, that could now open up these last revelations to the universe by God the Father. Must have been an incredible sight that John saw. And remember this, John didn't see that in 90 A.D., as the reality of it. He was foreseeing that which was happening in the future. Okay? This is part of the confusion about the book of Revelation. John was seeing something that had not yet occurred, and the Lord took him up to a place and showed him things that had not yet been revealed. So he was looking at something that was going to happen in the future. This is the true sense of, the ultimate prophetic, where God takes you up into a place and he will show you exactly what is going to happen that has not happened yet. John was privileged to that. So what are the seven seals? I want to start with this first. What are the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls? Uh, I think this is important for us to know because uh, although we, I don't want to get into them uh, so deeply that it takes five years to do it, I do want to set a chronology uh, or an order of things so that you can have a sensibility of where your prayers fit in to this situation. These things are going to happen whether we pray or not, by the way. However, 
the Lord will show us in this particular book the effect of our prayers on the outcomes of these events. And this is important to us. First of all, uh, the seven seals are found in Revelation, the sixth chapter and the eighth chapter. The seven trumpets are found in Revelation 8, 6 through 21, and 11, 15 through 19. And then the seven bowls are found in Revelation 16, uh, 1 through 21. Now, um, I would say this to you. Um, there are three succeeding or successive series of end time judgments. These are in succession. These things that are being poured out, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls are all judgments of God. There are, are no nice things in there in terms of human comfort and human flesh. These are very difficult things. These are last day things. And by the way, every single one of these things, without exception, will occur. Uh, there's great imagery and great symbolism in the book of Revelation, but I will tell you that uh, even the simplistic um, interpretations and hermeneutics that are, are, are utilized in, in discerning this book will lead you to the conclusion that these events are powerful, powerful judgments and they are, in some cases, readily understood. Secondarily, the judgments get progressively worse. This is what you find. You find that the, the things in the seven bowls are far worse than the things in the seven seals. So the judgments get progressively worse and more devastating as the end times progress. So you see that the Lord, and the way he is uh, propagating judgment upon the earth, is that he starts with a type of judgment, and then the judgment gets more and more and more severe as time goes on. Thirdly, the seven seals, uh, the trumpets, and the bowls are all connected to each other. They are all literally, linearly connected uh, to one another. Um, we'll start with the seals first. Uh, the first four of the seven seals are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, and in your Bible, if you will, turn to Revelation, the sixth chapter. Uh, I know you are all carrying your Bibles around. So let's open them this morning, uh, because this is something I want you to kind of follow along in your Bible. You can mark it up if you're a Bible marker. Some people don't like to mark their Bibles. Uh, mine are full of marks everywhere, but uh, you can follow along, uh, kind of, if you will, with this understanding. Um, the first seal introduces the Antichrist. This is in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. It says, And I saw the Lamb, and he broke one of the seven seals. Uh, actually, if you look at this in the Greek sensibility, it's not the one of the seven seals, it's the first of the seven seals. He breaks the first of the seven seals, which is obvious with the context. And he says, And I heard one of the four living creatures saying as with a voice of thunder, Come. Now you're going to hear that word a lot in the book of Revelation. The angels saying, Okay, this seal was broken, now Bring it on. What does the seal say? And then bring it on. And verse 2 says, And I looked, and John looked up when he said that word, Come, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, for years, many people thought this was Jesus. Jesus is the white horse, right? He's the one with the crown. He's the conqueror, the conquering king, and all of this kind of stuff like that. But you've got to remember, that in the context of this judgment, that Jesus is never utilized by God as a cursory judgment upon the world. His actions alone will cause judgment, but he himself did not come to judge. This is out of his own mouth. The Son of Man does not come to judge. So what is happening here is that the white horse and he who sits on it is actually 
the release of the Antichrist. He says, and uh, he had, sitting on the swords, he had been given a bow. The bow means an article of war. Jesus doesn't conquer with a bow, by the way. Jesus doesn't conquer with a sword or a bow or any implement of war. That's one of the proof contexts of the fact that this is not Jesus on the white horse. This is the Antichrist on the white horse. And a crown was given to him. Well, the world, how many of you know the world is going to crown the Antichrist? He is going to be crowned. And he is going to be riding around on his white horse. But he's going out to conquer. He's going out to conquer. And remember, Jesus doesn't conquer by the bow. He conquers in the heart. Your heart is conquered with the Lord. Conquering and to conquer is what it actually says. So the first seal introduces the Antichrist. The second seal causes great warfare. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 3, he says, and he broke the second seal, indicating that the first one was the first. And I heard a second living creature say, come. And another, a red horse, went out. And to him who sat on it was granted to take peace from the earth, that men would slay one another. And a great sword was given to him. So the second seal causes great warfare. So the Antichrist comes on first, and then the second seal is opened up, and then war is breaking out in massive directions, in, and for, and with, in, including many nations. The third seal in chapter and verse five says, "And when he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, "Come." And I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hands. And I heard, as it were, a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius. That's a full day's wages, by the way, a denarius. And do not harm the oil and the wine. Those are the luxuries of life. Some people who are going to be very rich are not going to be affected as much by what is coming on when the third seal that causes this great, incredible famine on the earth and the imbalance of the scales. And you know that in commerce in those days, when you would, matter of fact, some of you might remember with your grandparents, when you go to a store, they would weigh things out on scales. When you, when you bought uh, rice or you bought wheat or something, they would actually weigh it out on scales. And that would cause the balance. And then you'd pay for the proper amount. But this, this particular time in our history, uh, this pair of scales are going to be in imbalance. So the economy is going to be thrown out of balance. And it's going to cost people a day's wages to buy a loaf of bread. Now, many of you know that in, in Nazi Germany, uh, in the 1930s, that were prior to the outbreak of war, in the 1939 to 1945 for, for Germany, you know that one of the reasons that Hitler pushed the button on, on, on war was that his economy, the economy that he inherited and propagated as well, was a hyperinflationary environment. As a matter of fact, you can, you can Google all this stuff. It's all there. There was a time in Germany's history in the early 30s, right after the United States' Great Depression, where they would actually take wheelbarrows of money, Deutschmarks, wheelbarrows full to the store so they could buy just regular stuff. And it would cost, it was so hyperinflated that it would take wheelbarrows, millions and millions of Deutschmarks. Deutsche marks to buy bread and milk and just regular things. That's called hyperinflation. Things are out of whack. And it caused, um, like many wars, wars are, all about the bucks type of thing, it caused Nazi Germany to enter into um, oh, another phase of, of warfare. So this is an important thing to understand that there is coming a time, and I believe it's already started. The precursor to this seal, this third seal, 
has already started. But I'm, uh, I also believe that the first two seals have already started. I believe that the Antichrist is walking around the earth today. I don't know how old he is or when he's going to come on the scene exactly, but I will tell you, I believe that he's already born. I believe the false prophet is already born, and I believe this earth is being set up right now for his arrival on the scene. And when that seal is broken and he is revealed, you will know that the beginning of the outpouring of the seven seals has begun. And then the fullness of what has already been developed with the economy and with the, the imbalances, with wars. There's always been wars and rumors of wars, according to the Lord. But you will see that all of a sudden it's going to get much more intense with these judgments. And uh, also, um, well, let's just go to the fourth seal. The fourth seal in verse 7. And then he broke the fourth seal, and I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and behold, a pale horse. New American Standard says ashen. It was the same word. Pale horse. And he who sat on it had the name Necron. Death is going to be written on that horse. And hell was following with him. So death and hell, or the spirit of death and hell, come upon the earth. Remember, this is directed towards the earth. And authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth, that is 25% of the population, which is equal to over a billion, over a billion people at this time, to kill with a sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. So you know that's not going to be a pleasant situation, but it's going to be an increase in intensity of what the uh, second and third seals are already have been brought onto the scene. Now seals 5 through 7, seal number 5, uh, Revelation verse six, uh, chapter 6, verse 9. He says, And uh, when he broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. These are the martyrs of the church who had gone on before. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell upon the earth and to each one of them was given a white robe so you find out that the fifth seal uh, tells us that those who will be martyred for their faith uh, in Christ during the end times um, and, and prior uh, God will he hear their cries for justice and then he will by the next several seals begin to give them their justice that's one of the principles behind the fifth seal that the Lord is himself is going to answer to the cries of the martyrs, those who have spilled their blood for Jesus Christ um, in that particular time. And then um, looking at the uh, sixth seal, uh, we'll look at Revelation 6.12 on that. He says, and I looked, and when he broke the sixth seal, which is the sixth judgment, initial judgment, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by the wind, the great wind. And the sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. This is a great shaking of the wrath of the Lamb, as you will find out. And the kings of the earth and the great men of the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in caves among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him, capital H, who sits on the throne, that's God the Father, and from the wrath of the Lamb. Now, the wrath of the Lamb steps in at the sixth seal, 
and all of a sudden you see incredible earthquakes to the extent that islands in the sea will change their position. For the great day of the wrath of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand against it? This is going to be one of the great revelations of mankind on the earth when these particular seals begin to unfold. Uh, the sixth seal, I, I wrote this down, that the devastating earthquakes occur, uh, causing massive upheaval and terrible devastation, along with unusual astronomical, unusual astronomical phenomena, and those who survive are going to cry out, um, we can't stand against this. Fall on us, hide us. Men are going to want to hide from God during this season. This is one of the reasons that in this day, today, while this is not happening, we don't want to hide from God. We want to do exactly the opposite. We want to sit on his lap. We want to be in his presence. There's only going to be, at the end, by the way, only two sides. There is no God's side, the Antichrist side, and then a vacation in Acapulco. You, well, I'm not going to be in this. I'm going to go to Acapulco. Or I'm going to go to southern France, so I'm not in this. You will be in this. The world will be in this. All your friends at work will be in this. Our government will be in this. All the nations will be in this one way or the other, black or white, there will be no gray. There will be no lukewarm in that day. It will be one side or the other. Either you will be hiding from God, running away from God, asking for stones to cover you because the Lamb of God is about to outpour his wrath upon the nations, or you will be in the context of being on the side or in the camp of the Lamb of of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, interestingly enough,